Okay, so I think we're going to start so that we keep the lunch briefing really for lunch. Um, we have the pleasure to welcome Professor Imelda with us today. Um, and Imelda is uh, the Andre Hoffman Assistant Professor for Environmental and Resource Economics at the Institute's Economics Department. And um, her research focuses on environmental and energy economics in general. And in particular, she works on the intersection of health, energy, gender, and environmental economics. She examines how clean energy transition and policy can enhance welfare and market outcomes. And she joined us at the Institute after her PhD uh, in economics from the University of Hawaii and from her postdoc at um, Carlos III University. She has her publications in the Journal of Development Economics, um, the, the American Economic Journal of Economic Policy, and um, today we're going to hear about some of her current work. And um, without further ado, I'm going to give her the floor to talk us through her lecture, and then um, we're going to have a discussion afterwards. So welcome, and we're very much looking forward to the conversation. <laughs> All right, I want to give you a warm welcome for uh, everybody's here in the room and also some in the online, um, connected online. So in the first 30 minutes, I'm going to um, give some facts and figures on these topics of green transition uh, in developing countries and share of, uh, some of my existing studies and ongoing ones uh, and moving on to the future. So what? so green transition signifies the process of transforming the economy. Uh, moving to a uh, more sustainable future, low carbon future, right? So it involves reducing greenhouse gas emissions, increasing the use of renewable energy, improving energy efficiency, promoting circular economy, and among others. So the key challenge is how to support uh, the green transitions while allowing economic growth and ensuring social justice. So today, I'm going to discuss the challenges in green transitions in developing countries and how these green transitions serves as a catalyst uh, to achieve multitude of um, sustainable development goals. As a starting point is power sector. So because decarbonization in these sectors comes first and subsequently influence other aspects. As you can see in this graph, the demand for energy is rapidly increasing since the 1990s till today, primarily driving by uh, developing countries. Uh, here is Asia, the, the biggest chunk, primarily China. So in the future, uh, the growth in this energy demand is expected comes uh, from emerging economies. So it is essential, therefore, to ensure that these countries have the ability to uh, provide viable alternatives to fulfill the demand that comes from cleaner energy sources. One of the initiatives is enabling countries to phase out coal power plants more quickly and efficiently. Yeah? So facing out coal power plant. Here is the map of all the coal power, global coal power plant in developing countries. You see majority is orange and a bit of reddish color, meaning that it is new and under construction, under constructions. So they primarily rely a lot on coal. However, in developed countries, such as Europe, US, some of them are, you see grayish area, uh, grayish circle, meaning that they are now uh, started to retiring this coal-fired uh, power plant. So facing, facing out this coal power plant, replacing with less polluting alternatives, such as wind and solar, is one of the key climate actions that government around the world could participate undertaking this mitigation action. Renewable technologies are now sufficiently scalable to replace much of the coal generation um, 
uh, coal generation plants, but diversifications of clean power source are important as well. Well, efforts can already be seen. In the graph here, we see cumulative uh, installed capacity from all of the sources, but we focus looking at the increasing trends in wind and solar PV. Primarily, solar PV is exponentially increasing uh, in the past uh, decade. So efforts actually can already be seen. Recent successful example is in Indonesia in 2023. Uh, this year, they inaugurated this floating uh, PV uh, claims one of the largest ones in Southeast Asia, and then they committed to triple the capacity of this uh, floating PV to about 500 megawatt, um, among other initiatives uh, that I didn't show it here, uh, you already seen in the news. So actions already uh, can be seen. But we only see those that are successful. There are challenges uh, on this uh, building, uh, installing these uh, renewable power generations. Why? The first one is energy, uh, the clean energy has a significant higher upfront capital costs in developing country due to a lack of access to technology, expertise, among other factors. So from the existing studies, what we see, although data for developing countries is also limited, what we already see in here uh, in the graph is uh, average uh, returns or cost of capital. Uh, for renewable plants, for instance, in Greece, GR, in India, It's a lot higher yeah, compared to, for instance, Denmark. They are very low, even since 2010. So number one is clear from the data that cost of capital in developing country, building these in the developing countries are higher than in developed country. Number two, solar radiation, as we see in the map, the contrasting color, solar radiation is the the red is uh, the color, it means the concentrations of solar radiations is higher. And solar radiations determine maximum solar capacity that can be generated. Uh, and what we see here is there's varied based on geographic locations. So say floating PV, the one that we see earlier, put it in Indonesia here. It cannot generate uh, uh, similar capacity, even though the installed capacity is the same. Suppose we compare it with Australia, the capacity is lower. So the same exact capacity, but given the solar radiation is lower, uh, we will lead up to uh, less power generated. So it makes it even costlier per megawatt generated uh, from coal power, uh, from uh, solar PV. I mean, similar applies to wind power even though I only show uh, solar. Third, nature of intermittency. So we know clearly that renewal is not avail always available every hour. There are some gaps. For instance, solar PV, we cannot generate power during uh, night time, only concentrated mostly during uh, daytime. So what does it mean? It means we need to spend extra investment for storage during no, no sun, no wind hours, right? So energy storage, true, they can help to uh, facilitate this intermittency availability of uh, power during certain hours. Pump hydro, also some extra cost of investment for storage. It's similar things also apply for wind. And the fourth is cost of uncertainty. So the supply of critical minerals required to build energy transition, such as batteries, are uncertain. Some are controlled by particular regions. Yeah? I mean, Europe learned the hard way uh, during the, the war in Ukraine. There are certain 
uh, policy actions, sanctions that leading to scarcity in gas, leading to higher price in gas, similar logic applies. So when expected supply of minerals will be low, prices will go up and it will lead to higher cost in uh, implementing this technology, higher than what we currently see. So at least there's uh, that four points that makes renewable uh, more costlier than we think it is uh, because of cost of capital, renewable power are uh, diverse, uh, cost of intermittency, and cost of insecurity, and uh, among others. So from my existing studies, even only considering one factor, which is intermittency, what we can see Renewable is costly, yeah, but it is nonlinear, meaning that if the goal is for a country moving from 40% to 50%, the cost, I mean, it's not very different moving away from 40 to 50%. But, I mean, later on in the next 20 or 50 years, we might aim from high, uh, for higher power shares, clean power shares. So we may want to move from you know 90 to 100 percent, and it's a lot uh, costlier uh, than just moving uh, down. So, key question: How do we make these costs uh, down? How do we lower these costs? So there are two. Ownership structures, two options we need to understand that uh, in developing countries, uh, mostly, commonly, what we see is the state-owned uh, electricity sectors. There are others, uh, privatizations where there's market there, but what is common that we see is state-owned. So it's owned by um, state or government. So if we consider state-owned ownership where market power is absent, we learn that if we allow demand participation, we can lower the costs down. We can reduce inefficiency such as curtailment. So what is curtailment is the uh, case where we throw out uh, excess power. During a very sunny day, we just generate more than what we consume. So we can actually lead to less curtailment and some gains in demand participation. And how, how does it work? So we modeled electricity supply and demand with 100% clean power in the future. So we are talking about in the future. Uh, here, uh, what I show you is just three sample days. We zoom in into three sample days, 24 hours in one box here. Yeah. This is 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours. These are the days, typical days. These are excess supply days. There's a lot of suns. These are no sun, no wind kind of situations where there's lack of power. Uh, generated from renewables. First of all, what we see is that diversification is needed yeah, for a least cost generation. And number two, how do we engage in demand participations? We need to create incentive for demand to react by offering them uh, different prices uh, across hours. So so-called variable pricing. Here is prices are flat which is a typical things that we see in the electricity sector. Every hour, the price is the same. So if we introduce variable price where prices are different, when there's a lot of power during this day, prices here are, are low, almost zero. While during hard days, no wind, no sun, it's costly to generate this uh, during this time, so prices can be higher. So if we optimize it and, uh, and we see that actually there are a lot of, if we offer them with flat price, there's a lot of these grays or yellow. It means this is a curtailed sun. So it means we throw away a lot of sun. Here, turquoise light, turquoise is a hydrogen fuel cell. 
And look at the contrast here. Here we have less consumptions of fuel, uh, fuel cell, hydrogen, and there's not uh, no more grayish curtail sun. So it means we optimize it, uh, the curtailment, uh, meaning demand side use that uh, curtailment to do something, recharge batteries, uh, do something on the storage side. I mean, the storing on demand side storing uh, is already there. The technology is there. This is one example. In case of conventional air condition, for instance, here uh, the logic is you uh, use electricity and then transform it into cooling the air or heating the room, right? But if we have storage, if we have incentive for demand side to do something, to, do, to store energy, it, technology is already there. There's thermal storage tank, so the contrast in before is that it doesn't exist. It directly transforms electricity to what we need, yeah, cooling or heating. Here we have storage. So it means this is an extra investment that demand side customers has to make in order to take advantage of high price and low price. Low price, you can recharge the storage thermal with hot water, you store the heating, or uh, when uh, it's, the che it's cheap and it's uh, summer, you can also uh, opt in for storing ice. So it's ice storage. And this technology is already there. It's already there, but we don't see that much. It could be because what we see now, the prices are flat and therefore there's no enough incentive for some of the uh, households or co commercial sectors to invest in this. Yeah. That is something in the future, and uh, how this variable pricing can play a role in lowering the costs of uh, renewables moving away uh, from non-renewable sources. So secondly, how do uh, we lower the renewable costs down by engaging in technology that drives efficiency? So energy conservations. So before we are talking in the future, let's talk about current uh, existing conditions in developing countries. Promoting efficiency, meaning consuming less energy or conservation is challenging. Why? Because electricity price in developing countries currently tend to be lower than what we expected them to be. Why? Because it doesn't yet accounted for the cost of pollution. It's not yet. So it's been low. It could also be because of um, subsidy on prices for social protections uh, reasons. This leads to a lower cost. Yeah? It leads to overconsumption of electricity. So again, what we ended up is overconsumption. And suppose we given these challenges as given, okay, lower price, so what can we do to encourage energy efficiency? I mean, let's learn from developed countries. So here, uh, most of the studies have done, giving uh, information to a household. So for instance, here in this study, they give this in-home display that show how much is energy price during certain times, so there's a certain critical peak price that has been implemented in the US. Here they show that certain times prices are high. And what they see is that by having these tools that give them information about the price, they are more responsive. So leading to less consumption uh, during peak time. So what, do, what can we do in developing countries? I mean, prices are flat. And, so and in-home display investment, these appliances is not cheap as well. So what can we do in developing countries? So current study, existing studies that I've done here is perhaps a simple metering we could take advantage of this. 
So me, uh, electricity metering exists for every household just to measure how much you consume. But there's a simple tweak here, the difference. There's one kind where you pay it later at the end of the month, which is what we are commonly see here. But now there's a new metering uh, that promotes uh, people to pay first. They have to buy the balance before they consume. So this is the prepaid meter, so-called. This is a, a postpaid meter. So this metering is uh, promoted to be implemented in developing countries due to many reasons. So, but in our study, we wanted to understand how does this, just a simple changing in when to pay can influence energy conservations. And do, we do see that people using uh, the metering where they have to pay it first, they are more aware of how much they consume they're more aware of how much the prices are, and therefore they are promoting more uh, responsible consumptions um, and not uh, overconsume uh, electricity. So, as I mentioned earlier, electricity sector is sort of the fuel behind conversion, uh, cleaning, make the other sectors to be cleaner. But in developing countries, some regions still do not have access to electricity. This is the fact, sadly. Also, electricity connections some in some regions are unreliable. Yeah. So we need to engage in transitioning technology. So for instance, in cooking, people have to use other source, yeah? Firewood, coal, mm, dung, kerosene, gas, yeah. I mean, the best, the cleanest one, where there is no burning uh, use for cooking uh, appliances, that electricity is the best because it's not exit uh, pollution, uh, polluting to the one who used the stove, right? But we see that uh, there's limited options uh, in the current uh, developing world. Uh, situation. And this dirty fuel has been the main source yeah, of adverse health effects. Uh, World Health Organization has been advocating for moving away uh, to cleaner fuel. Studies done in the past, uh, that I've done in the past, where if people move away from dirty fuel to a cleaner one, actually we can see a substantial health improvement, especially for infants, which are more prone to uh, risk in, um, in environmental risk. But it's beyond that. So that's, it's clear that moving away from cleaner fuel, there is uh, reductions in pollution exposure, uh, it leads to better health, but actually there are other aspects, social aspects. So due to gender norm, uh, women and children childrens are mostly the one who are uh, exposed uh, a lot more uh, from cooking activities. Uh, women are the one who have to uh, responsible for the activities and kids are usually the younger ones uh, accompany them or helping them. So what we see here, if they move away from uh, dirty to cleaner one, actually what we see is health improve for those who use the uh, dirty stoves before. So it improves health for women and children. Therefore, it, it will lead to a lower disparity in health between men and women. And we know that Health is the input, or is primary input for productivities. Uh, so if health improve, uh, it leads to uh, increase in productivity. Lastly, I acknowledge the green transitions is a global imperative. The challenges faced by developing countries are interconnected uh, with the broader sectors. There's trade, there's financing, and more recently is the question, how do we ensure a just transition? Which, all of this I leave out for, uh, from today's talks. 
For example, plan effort in just energy transition partnership, accelerating coal uh, uh, transition, there's a joint initiative, World Bank, International a uh, Energy Agency, to support coal dependent countries uh, implement uh, coal transition plans. These are areas where evidence-based research can focus in the future to see how effective are these mechanisms. To conclude, so green transitions in developing countries are not without challenges. Uh, as we see it, our factors why we see it's more challenging in developing countries to move uh, to green transitions and based on evidence that I see is that demand participation can uh, improve efficiency, lower the cost, cost down, and the gains is higher as we move on towards cleaner, larger shares of renewables or clean power. And lastly, gains from energy, uh, clean energy is actually not only limited to health, but actually can expand beyond that to equalities and increase in productivities. I mean, as a researcher, policymaker, students, let's engage in these discussions on advancing our understandings on these topics so that evidence-based policy research uh, can grow and inform uh, policies for the best possible outcomes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, yeah, it was very on time. <laughs> um, so for the Q&A, um, the discussion we're going to have now, I ask you that when you have a question, um, please introduce yourself, say your name, and um, then please ask a question. And um, as we say in academia, you know, I have a question that's more of a comment. We want the question and not the comment. Um, and to start us off, so I'm moderating the conversation today. Um, Imelda is also a member of the Center for International Environmental Studies at the Institute. And um, my name is Nina Kidalin. I'm the executive director of the center. Um, I'm not an economist, I'm a sociologist. So um, my first question to start us off, and whilst I ask and Imelda answers, you can formulate your questions. Then we have a student who will come around with the microphone. Um, is that I was wondering, and I think it's a classic sociology versus economist <laughs> conversation we can have, about um, your data collection methods. So especially for, um, and I know this is you know, maybe a more academic question to start us off and then we can move into more policy related questions. Um, but especially in terms of the consumer data, like of course we know that data collection in certain countries is a, is a big problem. Um, also, I'm particularly interested because you study this intersection of, of economic incentives with welfare and so on and so forth. Um, I'm assuming you know there is like over or under reporting of satisfaction, these types of things. Like, how do you or like how can we think about data collection um, from this more holistic perspective in these? I think it's on. Like, I think it's just on. Um, in, in with regards to to these types of very personal economic questions. So I think, first of all, it's a good question, uh, academic perspective, how do we uh, uh, do these things? I mean, what is important is usually the data privacy yeah? in research. Um, we ensure an anonymity. In uh, the relevant uh, case that we do, we, do, we use... Um, data that comes from the electric utilities, companies, so it's anonymized by, uh, by them. Mm -hmm. And some part of our studies, we also do uh, surveys in which um, you ensure anonymity as well because you have to go through the ethics board, uh, you ask, uh, so the questions are already clear there. And I think with that uh, standards, um, it should uh, not in any way will hurt the participants and, and we can still learn uh, something out of that. So I would say standards are clear uh, on this. 
Thank you. Um, if you have a question, also if you have a question online, you can just type it into the chat function and I'm gonna see it on the iPad here. Um, and I think there is, if we go one by one, so if we start with Vishwa in the back and then we can continue from there. Presentation. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Vishva. I work at the WTO. And um, my question um, is regarding the deployment or the rate of deployment that you mentioned. And that's underpinned a lot by manufacturing capacity of the clean energy technology. Mm -hmm. But over recent years, we have a debate going on on the inputs for the manufacturing of these technologies. And this I mean minerals and uh, other semi assembly equipment for production. And that will underpin how deployment will occur. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on how um, movements in that domain will have an impact on deployment in the future. Thank you. Uh, I, I mentioned this uh, also, this aspect of, I mean, I assume it comes into the availability of inputs in the future. And it has the components that I mentioned, which is uncertainty. So there's a, partly there's a uncertainty aspect on the deployments, yeah? There's also aspect of uh, transportations of all of these, yeah? And my perspective, my take on this is that in the future where we demand uh, more of this technology, uh, there are more trade on these uh, transactions and all that. We will face a, f a stage where the supply will be hit the limit and demand is increasing. By economic theory, it will lead to higher price. So these are something that we need to take into account, the fact that the price in the future, we'll have uh, increasing components. There's a non-zero probability that the price uh, of implementing this technology will increase. Although what we see now is cost is decreasing because of R&D and all that, right? Because demand is low still. So I would say in the, in the future when we hit certain capacity limit in terms of supply of the inputs, rare uh, uh, minerals and all that, we will hit a uh, uh, certain limit in terms of lowering costs down, maybe costs will go up. Thank you very much. There was also another question at the top back. Hello, I'm Bjorn Olalin here. I'm a visiting fellow at the center. Uh, so we heard this morning from the, in the news that Saudi Arabia is putting out a lot of contracts for cheap oil with, with, um, in many low-income countries. So I guess that will affect the calculations of, so you quoted Steve, uh, Stephens and so on. It's very interesting. Oh, first of all, thank you. It was a super, super nice talk. Very, give a lot of food for thought. But so how will that affect sort of the cost estimates? Have you looked into that? And on that note, I guess the, the energy efficiency will be good any which way. But then have you looked at the rebound effects? Thanks. So there's two points. One is about uh, fluctuations in oil price. Uh, uh, yeah. So non-renewable, uh, the cost might go down on s some aspect. Yeah. I mean, these are just one part of the story. I mean, it's not telling uh, uh, a global scale, and it's also not talking about the trends in the future that we see. I would. My sense is that in the future, these are one, just one par, uh, part that may go, uh, make prices uh, go down a bit, but at some point it will uh, stabilize into an increasing trend. Why? We see uh, a lot of climate actions on um, pricing the carbon, um, carbon trading, all of, uh, a lot of regulatory initiatives have started to uh, play a role and this will make uh, the price, uh, additional cost of carbon added into these non-renewable sources. So there's a net, there's a net negative, there's also other factors that will be, uh, in make it uh, the cost uh, increase again. So I would say in the long term, you will trending uh, uh, 
increasing trend, which is what we want, uh, uh, hopefully. And the rebound of facts, I agree. Uh, it has been documented in the literature. In short, what is the rebound of fact is that if the energy cost is uh, cheaper, perhaps uh, putting a solar PV on your rooftop, your, your consumptions will be free, perhaps, if you uh, put in enough solar PV. So it will lead to more consumptions on this. But in the net, uh, we still, uh, what we care is about reducing uh, the overconsumptions of polluting one, because there's a lot of externality costs, right? If they want to consume more of clean uh, power, that's okay, and it's actually not that bad, uh, it, because it's also welfare improving. So there's a lot of discussions whether we should make rebound effects. There's no rebound effects. Yeah, there's some maybe 10, 20% of rebound effects, but it also means that they are uh, they're consuming more, maybe they enjoy more, or they uh, uh, putting more appliances. So there are some positive aspects into that. Uh, this is something to to be uh, considered, and yeah. But the story about the rebound effect, I would say, it's interesting on itself, and uh, it's not yet developing countries not yet to the stage on uh, on rebound effect. I would say it's there's a lot more stories on rebound in developed countries. I would say. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, we have a question line, but I have a question that kind of follows up a bit on this. Um, could you maybe expand a little bit on the on the question of subsidies also, um, and um, and explain a little bit also for the for the students that we have here and online um, a bit more, you know, especially with this aspect that you think about the the welfare question um, of on the one hand, of course, having to, or like historically, Indonesia in particular, maybe having to subsidize electrification to expand electricity access versus now having discussion around, you know, which type of energy should be subsidized in order to balance off green transition and at the same time not um, have, you know, um, bad outcomes in, in welfare, et cetera. So can you discuss a little bit these questions of subsidy? Uh, yeah, subsidy is a, a favorite topic <laughs> to be discussed. Subsidy has a different goal. Yeah, Usually we want to subsidize because we cannot achieve the first best, uh, which is making the dirty one uh, more expensive. It's harder in practical and politically unpopular. So subsidy, here you go. And uh, we subsidize also be, to protect uh, social protection, some could not afford and all that. And whether, my take on whether we need to subsidize uh, to achieve green transition uh, along those lines, um, I would say yes, because we are not yet in the first base uh, uh, standards on e economic theories and all that, where cost of carbon can be incorporated in the in the you know generating coal power plant. So it creates this this incentivized coal power plant to uh, to to keep using their uh, power plants. It's not yet feasible here because we still want to live in a world where there is electricity continuously, nonstop. So how do we increase uh, uh, renewables while not making existing uh, power plants, electric utility go bankrupt and, and stop their business? This is not what we want. So we can still allowing this um, non-renewable power plants with some of the uh, mechanisms that already been implemented and promoted in G20, COP, uh, which is the new one, just energy transition partnership, financing, meaning that we provide money so that the uh, renewables can grow. And we also pay these coal power plants in order to retire earlier than, uh, than before, than as they're planned. They have to be uh, uh, 
compensated for the stranded assets of that. So we can survive with what we have by financing coal power plant as well, and we can also think about um, providing, subsidizing, make it the renewables uh, cheaper to begin with, and then maybe we can uh, uh, move on and converge to to clean, uh, green transitions uh, in the next two or three decades. Thank you. Um, so for our question online, um, it's a question from Sangram uh, from Nepal, and he's asking if you could elaborate on the role of local communities and their involvement in developing a green transition process. Local community, uh, good question, local community. Um, there's two ways. One is they can uh, make the discussions, increasing awareness of uh, political leaders to concerns about this. I think it's important. Now, nowadays, the, there's increasing awareness of green transitions, the need uh, to boost it up. It's also because some, there are key players in um, many and even more. So uh, local communities, uh, in terms of voicing their uh, needs, is important. It plays an important role. And also, there's uh, other discussions about uh, distributed energy generation, meaning that uh, you can have a community level clean power plant, perhaps solar PV, uh, that you can build for a community. And this, we see it a lot, uh, especially in the areas where it's unelectrified, it's unreachable, and it's just not, there's no return on investment in implementing a tr uh, uh, in building transmission capacity. So they cannot connect it to the grid, and therefore they have to have their own uh, distributed energy generations, and it's usually more efficient in a community scale. So uh, one, you can advocate it from political economy perspectives, and one is that you can actually uh, create uh, and make uh, distributed energy generation more efficiently with the community. Uh, this is also uh, has been documented in the studies. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Is there another question in the room? Otherwise, she set me up for a question. <laughs> um, so I think that one aspect that would be quite interesting to hear more about, um, also for, for people to be able to, to imagine these different contexts a little bit more, is um, when I saw the, the picture that you showed in Indonesia of the floating PV, um, I was wondering these um, interactions between, I'm assuming they are private companies who, um, who built a lot of these um, PV, yes, no? Uh, no, so okay. so I think this is something I mean, that would be interesting to, to elaborate uh, on a little bit. If you kind of explain a bit more um, in developing countries, a lot of, of course, you know, generally electricity providers um, that are that are state owned. We understand how that works, but expand a little bit more on on how this works here, because I think in Europe we are very accustomed to. Um, all of the, the solar energy um, companies in, in Germany, for example, who are now debating leaving or who are going bankrupt, etc. So we are very much used to this debate between the private sector and the public sector in the green energy transition. So if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on, um, on this in developing countries. Uh, yeah, so that solar PV is owned by the state-owned electric utility, so it's sort of government-owned, uh, kind of uh, asset. But of course, the one who is building that is firm. Yeah? So essentially, they do auction. Uh, we want to procure uh, these amounts of capacity in this certain dam, so open an auction. So firms will submit their bids, just like regular procurement, right? And they, they will, uh, s several firms will come in and say, I, w I can build a 200 megawatt with this amount. The other firms, okay, I can provide with less amount. And then uh, essentially the, the utility companies will uh, ask the host, the one who's opened the procurement wheel, 
uh, pick the one that is most uh, reliable, cost efficient, uh, and all that. So these are, uh, the keyword is auction, meaning that you, you opened it up um, so that uh, firms can come in and bid uh, bidding on how much they can uh, uh, produce, how much they are willing to pr uh, build it, in how much uh, how much the cost of that. In for instance, in Europe, we also have auctions. Yeah, uh, we also have auctions. So uh, in wind, uh, I mean, yeah, in renewables, uh, essentially. But I think the the difference usually that I observe in developing versus developed countries is amount of participants. So in developed countries, you can easily get a lot more tenders. Uh, so the result of more participants is that lower costs, meaning that they are more competition, uh, comp uh, competitive, so there are more competitions uh, here, so leading to lower costs. In developed Developing countries is a bit more challenging because of regulations uh, from the countries itself. Some countries can have this uh, uh, very close, uh, not very open for um, uh, outsiders to come in because of many reasons, yeah? Could be political reason, some uh, inherent interest uh, in in getting the bid. So it's not that transparent. A lot of other factors leading to numbers of participants. Bidders are less than commonly uh, see, we see in the developing uh, auction, developing country, developed countries auctions. So it's leading us to um, usually typically higher price. In what we see. Uh, in the graph, the first graph earlier, that the cost of capital is tend to be higher, and essentially, when I you know go in, also other factors why it's also high, uh, why there's not much of participations and bidding's from firms here. Uh, when I go and meet those suppliers of renewable plants. They are very limited in terms of pricing they can bid because there's government regulations, they will be paid based on regulated price. And based on their size of a company, it's not possible for them to offer on that price. Or they can offer on that price, but they may, um, they may not be that profitable. And I only talk with one, so it could be there are many others that just didn't uh, hit the uh, rate of return for their investment if the prices are being capped uh, in certain level uh, by the regulations as well. Uh, and there's also a weakness in terms of expertise, so technology access, uh, and all that making the prices are higher than developed countries. Thank you. Um, if there's nobody else, I have one last question. <laughs> um, could you, I think going back a little bit to the question that Pianola asked about, um, about Saudi Arabia and now with the COP coming up, could you expand a little bit in, in your opinion, and I know it's an opinion question and we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, the difference between how a sociologist would see it and how an economist would see it. But can you um, put this a little bit into a perspective of, of geopolitics, of a global political economy, um, because I think that a common narrative is that overall, of course, the, the large polluters are, you know, still in the developed countries, so, you know, are we just pushing these small levers here, or is your argument more really about that welfare in these states can also so much improve by green transition that we should push for this, even though you know we can have this larger geopolitical discussion about just transition and so on and so forth. The latter one, where <laughs> uh, moving away from uh, dirty to clean, I think uh, it's a win-win solution. It's costly, 
But at the end of the day, if we account for externality, the cost, additional costs, can be health, can be a, a, an equal burden for the society uh, with the evidence that I show. Uh, it's, we just don't quantify these additional costs associated with non-clean uh, non <laughs> or dirty sources that we easily uh, discounted that. I mean, historically, we see uh, these non-renewable, uh, non-renewable dirty fuel as a, as a cheaper source. It's just because now renewable at that time are very, the costs are very high. There's a lack of R&D, research and development. Now, because we understand a little bit more about the damage it can cause from carbons and all that. The awareness are a lot uh, increased a lot in the past decades. So it will weight the the dirty fuel down. And in fact, we already see uh, a lot of uh, decreasing costs in renewables. It will bumps up uh, the renewables in the future. So uh, developing countries, I think, in the longer run. It's still a win-win solution to moving on to greener transitions. And again, it's not, I'm not talking about solar and wind solely. We are talking about cleaner power. That means diversification. It can come from solar and wind, can come from geothermal, it can come from pump hydro, it can come from demand participations, energy efficiency. All of these are moving towards sort of greener transitions and uh, left these uh, so dirty economies uh, back. And I think locally it will have uh, benefits health and uh, uh, factor, social factors that I mentioned earlier. Also, in the globally, it will, uh, which is what we are aiming for. I don't think there's any need if there's no more world uh, exists in the next 200 years. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't think there is a, an option to not moving away uh, from the dirty source. So thank you very much um, for very much succinctly summing this up in the end. And um, I wish all of you a good afternoon. And thank you very much for coming. And thank you again to Imelda for the presentation and the conversation. Thank you very much for moderating and everyone as well here.